Well, welcome to the bridge. Let's stand to our feet and let's put our hands together. right in together God this song is our story and as we sing these words we just lean into the truth behind it how great the chasm that lay between us how high the mountain I could not climb in 
for believers and so this is really if you're a follower of Jesus if you have accepted him as Lord and Savior and maybe you're new here to the church and you're just figuring out this whole faith thing and so we'd actually encourage you not to partake in communion but just to watch what we do but I love communion so much because this is time where you and I we get to express gratitude to who God is for what he's done 
And that's what that whole song is about. There was this God who loved you and I so much that 2,000 years ago, he sent his son Jesus to live this perfect life. And then he went to a cross and he was, fall, he was falsely accused, he was beaten, he was whipped, and it was all for you and I because he loved you and he went to that cross to die for your sins and for my sins. And so even as you walked in here today, I know that that communion cup, there's two different elements, but I just want you to look at that real quick. That bread, it represents Jesus' body being broken for you. Can you imagine the flogging that he went through? The hurt, the pain, the tears. And he did it all because he loved you and I so much. Or while he hung on that cross gasping for air, he did that because he loved you and he cared for you and he wanted to forgive you for your sins. This is how good the God is that we worship. This is how good our God is. And so even right now, I just wanna give you some time where you can come before this God humbly. And he says, if we come before him humbly and if we ask for forgiveness, he said that he's willing to forgive every single time. And so I don't know what it was for you this week. Maybe this week you had a bad attitude. Maybe you didn't treat your family the best way, your wife, your kids. Maybe it was something at work. And God, he's calling you to bring that before the cross right now to ask for forgiveness. And he says that he will forgive. And so this time it's between you and God right now. And then I'll close us here in a little bit as we go through the elements. that Jesus, he was, the, he was with his disciples and he was eating the last supper. He sat with them at this big table and as they sat there, you guys can actually pull out that bread. It's gonna be that top piece right there with the bread, but Jesus, he looked at his disciples and as he passed out that bread, he said, this is my body that's gonna be broken for you. He said, eat this and do this in remembrance of me. And then it says a little while later, he would pour some wine for his disciples. And he would say that this is my blood that's gonna be made in the new covenant. Drink this in remembrance of me. Heavenly Father, I am so thankful for who you are. I'm so thankful for what you did for every single one of us by sending your perfect son, Jesus, to go and live a perfect life and then to die on that cross so that we can have the forgiveness of sins but more than that, God, so we can be reunited with you and that we can have eternity forever. Thank you so much for the sacrifice that you've done. God, I pray that we would have hearts of gratitude right now. We love you and we pray this all in Jesus' name, amen. Would you stand as we continue to sing together? Let's continue to reflect in our hearts and respond in worship as we remember Christ's death and resurrection and all that he's done. See on the hill of Calvary, my Savior bled for me, my Jesus set me free. And look at the wounds that give me life, grace flowing from his side, no greater sacrifice. We sing what he's done, what he's done. What he's done, all the glory and the honor to the Son. My sins are forgiven, my future is heaven. So I praise God for what he's done. life has overcome. Oh, speak, say the name above all names, over every broken place. He is risen from the grave.
fathers will complete. He reigns in victory. We say, sing hallelujah to the King. He is worthy to receive all the worship we can bring. Come on, you know it. Let's sing that together. so thankful for Jesus's death on the cross and for what he's done for you and I. And that's what makes communion so special, that there's this God who went to the cross and died for us so that we can come before him. And that's exactly what we're going to do right now. We're going to pray and we're going to be praying for Just One International today. I love Just One International. They're a team that's ending cycles of poverty in Honduras. And they do far more than that. They actually provide for this community. Actually, a few weeks ago, we, we had a team go down there for a week and they got to do some unbelievable work connecting with the community, with the kids. And so we love what Just One is doing all over in Honduras. But there are a few ways that we can be praying for Just One, but this time it's between you and God, and then I'll close us here in a little bit. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for Just One International. We thank you for the work that you're doing through Honduras with the teams that you're sending down there. God, thank you for the cycles of poverty that you're ending through education. But more than that, we pray for all these kids in this program to come and know you, Jesus, that you would surround them with leaders, with people who love you so much that they would point them to this light, and that's you. And thank you also for this time that we got to be reminded about communion about the precious sacrifice that you made on that cross for every single one of us because you loved us. And for that, we are forever thankful. We love you and we pray this all in Jesus' name, amen. Well, you may take a seat. Well, welcome to the bridge. My name is Denim, I'm the campus pastor here. And if this is your first time, thank you so much for joining us. Our mission here at the bridge is to connect you to God, to people and to service. And we really hope that that happens for you. We would love to connect with you right now. And so if you would pull out your phone and scan that QR code that's on the screen behind me, or even in that bulletin in front of you, this will take you to our connect card. Please fill this connect card out with as much information as you feel comfortable giving us. If you're a first time guest, that could just be any information you feel comfortable sharing, like your name, number, email. And then if you're a returning guest, it could just be your name and any other information that's might've changed. You can also check some boxes to serve for groups. We actually have groups starting up in a few weeks and we would love for you to join a group. And then right through that QR code, I also want you to know that you can give. But if this is your first time, please don't feel obligated to give. This is really for those who call the bridge home. We'll have some offering buckets on the way out. And here's a couple more things happening around the bridge. Hi, I'm Maddie, and here's what's happening at the bridge. 
Are you new to The Bridge? If you answered yes, then Bridge 101 is for you. This two-week class is your next step to find out more about who we are and where we're going as a church. Our next class meets on September 15th and 22nd. Sign up on our website. Groups are coming soon and signups open in two weeks. Our goal is for every person in our church to be part of a group. And we believe we have something for everyone. First, community groups. These groups meet two to three times a month and we have groups for men, women, co-ed, young adults, and college. Second, support groups. These groups exist to walk alongside you as you navigate difficult moments in your life. They include divorce care, grief share, parents praying for adult children, purity groups, and more. We're excited groups are back. Get ready to sign up. Parents, do you have a child between three years old and fifth grade? Send them to Awana starting this fall. Awana will run every Monday from 6.30 to 8 p.m. Your kid will have a blast. Registration is now open. Sign up today. Ladies, Girls Getaway at the Woods is just over one month away. And men, we have man camp for you too, a few weeks after that. If you haven't registered yet, don't wait any longer. Both weekends will have amazing teaching, great music, and fun indoor and outdoor activities, including campfires, high ropes, zip lines, shooting, and so much more. These events are already filling up. Visit Camp's website to learn more and get registered today. That's it for today. Please grab your phone right now and put it on silent. If you need to take it out of your purse or pocket, go for it. It really helps us create an amazing atmosphere. Thanks for watching. Have a great rest of the service. Liberty or give me death, Patrick Henry. I have a dream, Martin Luther King Jr. One small step for man, one giant leap for mankind, Neil Armstrong. The only thing we have to fear is fear itself, Franklin D. Roosevelt. Ask not what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country, John F. Kennedy. These iconic words have echoed through the corridors of history, inspiring generations to act with boldness and conviction. Tonight, we want to dive into the essence of boldness, a quality that transcends time and circumstances. What is boldness? Boldness is the audacity to stand firm like an African lion in the face of adversity to dream beyond the confines of the present and take steps that can transform the world. 248 years ago, 56 bold men with little to gain and much to lose, they launched a global movement of democracy and they signed the Declaration of Independence. It was a bold move. They knew that independence from England was a long, long shot and their names on that document would cost them dearly but they were bold, bold as an African lion, bold in their belief that this new American experiment would propel the world into freedom. Most of the signers paid with their dear lives. But what is the result today? People like me come to America and can enjoy the freedom. 2,000 years ago, the church launched, not as an institution, not as a building, not as a show, but as a movement. Shortly after Jesus had walked, had died and resurrected, 120 people, 20 people walked into the streets of Jerusalem saying that God had done something amazing. Just outside the gate where Jesus was crucified and he walked out of the tomb, they were saying, we didn't just hear this. What they were saying is, we saw it with our eyes and we are not going to shut up about it. The original group of 120 people grew to 
thousands of people. It was a mega church in Jerusalem that spread through the region and went from one big church to a network of churches. And because they were so effective and because they were so bold, persecution started. The problem for the persecutors is that they did not know that the blood of the saints is the seed of the church. And the church grew and expanded. It was unstoppable. It could not be contained. Yet the persecution continued. The guy, one of the guys who was the main persecutor was a guy named Saul of Tarsus. He hated Christians. He, his three goals was to imprison them, beat them, and put them in jail. But you know what? God grabbed a hold of his heart. That same Saul became a spokesman for the very movement that he sought to destroy. He was sent out by the Jerusalem church and he began planting new churches in strategic locations. His focus was taking the gospel to Gentiles. And what began as a Jewish movement soon became a unifier for Jews and Gentiles. And they started calling each other brother and sisters. And this movement kept rolling and rolling. And today, it's alive. It's unstoppable. And it's uncontainable. And even though it's not been a perfect movement, there have been abuses. There have been crusades. There have been horrible atrocities done falsely in the name of Christianity. There's still been a remnant of people who are bold. Who are saying this is not about a building or money. Or this is not about a culture, uh, a social club. This is not a subculture. This is a mission. It's the mission Jesus was on. And one that he gave to his believers. When he gave to us the great commission. We're not slowing down. We're not getting sidetracked. That's why some people have hijacked the church for their political agenda or their personal gain. That's why some have attempted to convert this movement into an empty social club. There's always been a group of people who have said, this is not, this is about the gospel. This is about Jesus changing lives. One life at a time. This is about running up the score against evil. This is about eternity. I love this. It's why James, the brother of Jesus, said in Acts chapter 15, he said, we should not make it difficult for the Gentiles who are turning to God. It's in other words, what he's saying is, let's not complicate the church. Let's not mess up the movement. Let's not make it so formal that people have to buy a dress or buy a suit before they can come. By the way, that's why at the bridge, we try to dress like normal people. Except for my boss, Junior Ziegler, you know? Right? But the, honor, but the beautiful thing is that we want to create a place where anybody can walk in. Whether you're a waitress at Olive Garden or whether you're a CEO at a Fortune 500 company, you can walk in here and both of you can feel welcome, feel special. We don't want to become inward focused. The early church was aimed at bringing in people and discipling them. And this is our mission. And we've seen this mindset time and time again as we've studied the book of Acts. And now we come to our 27th sermon in the book of Acts. It's been incredible. Hasn't it been? Come on, people. Hasn't it been? It's been awesome. Yeah, you can clap. Come on. Yeah. It's been great. Ask is all, Acts is all about the launch and the growth of the church. And I love it. We've been Indated with emails and social media, shout outs and texts in the church office. People saying, I love the book. I forgot about the section. And they've enjoyed it. And for those of us who've been teaching this, we are committed to the story of the gospel. Changing stories. Because those, the story of the gospel changes 
other people's stories in epic ways. And when their stories are changed, their stories changes other stories. And those stories echo into eternity. So, tonight, we're going to look at the final chapter in Acts chapter 28, verses 11 to 31. If you have your Bible, you should turn to Acts chapter 28, verse 11 to 31. If you don't, there's a Bible in the pew, in the chair in front of you, and you can grab it while you look through it. I'm going to pray real quick. Father, this is your word. We believe it's true. Open our hearts and our minds that we will understand what we're about to hear. Help me to be clear. I submit myself under the leadership of your Holy Spirit. Use me to communicate your truth with clarity. In Jesus' name, amen. So we start in verse 11, Acts 28, verse 11. After three months, we sat still in a ship that had withered in the island, a ship of Alexandria, with the twin gods as a figurehead. This was probably late in February or March, the end of their winter season, when the sea was unforgivable and sometimes unnavigable. It was hard to navigate the sea at this time. And the twin gods were Castor and Pollux, the patron saints of sailors. Sailors looked to these people. And they were two sons of Zeus. Asian mariners considered seeing the Gemini constellation during a storm as a good sign, a good omen for the, for the journey. And I think Luke was trying to be funny here as they boarded this good luck ship after the shipwreck we had studied about and the storm in chapter 27. And then look at verse 12. He said, putting in at Syracuse, we stayed there for three days. And from there, there was... As we made a circuit and arrived at Rigium. This is an island. And they arrived there at the bottom of the mainland of Italy. And after one day, a south wind sprung up. And the second day, we came to Potelli. There we found brothers. And they invited us to stay with them for seven days. This showed that the gospel had reached far as Italy. People there. Welcome Paul and his fellow Christian travelers. And he says, and so we came to Rome. Meaning that they were now on the way via Domitiana Road. That leads to the famous Appian Way into Rome itself. Look at verse 15, please. And the brothers there, when they heard about us, came as far as the Forum of Appius and the three taverns to meet us. On seeing them, Paul thanked God and took courage. Remember, Paul did not bring the gospel to Rome. He had written this epistle to the Romans prior to this. There were already pockets of Jewish believers in Rome. And here Paul came down to meet with them and they were welcoming Paul as he came to Rome. Look at verse 16, if you would. And we came into Rome and Paul was allowed to stay there by himself with the soldier who guarded him. There was remarkable freedom that they gave Paul. Probably because Paul was, what? A Roman citizen. And the accusation against him was not in violation of the Roman law. So he was not a flight risk. Look at verse 17. Verse 17 of chapter 28. After three days, he called together the local leaders of the Jews. This would have been the synagogues. Remember, Paul, whenever he went to a city, he would go to the synagogue first. He wanted to speak to the leaders. And what he would do, he would show to the Old Testament, the Tanakh, to show how Jesus was the fulfillment of the prophesied Messiah. He tells them that, he tells these Jewish leaders while he was in Rome about his arrest. And then, look at verse 23, from morning till evening, he expounded to them, testifying to the kingdom of God and trying to convince them about Jesus from the law of Moses and from the prophets. 
What is happening here? This is a powerful statement. I love this verse. It says, Paul expounded two things. The kingdom of God. And he talked about Jesus. He was trying to convince them. He addressed them about two areas that was of concern to them. And what I love about Paul's strategy to teach them is that he expounded the scripture. The Greek word for that is ekitatami, which means to make clear, not complicate things. He explained with clarity. He didn't add anything to the gospel. He just explained it by focusing on the kingdom of God, not social issues, but he talked mainly about Jesus. And he used their Bible, which is the Old Testament, because now they're living out the New Testament. He taught the law of Moses and the prophets. You see, this is strategic. Paul knows about his audience. What does he know about the audience? They were waiting for the Messiah. And they were tired of being oppressed. They long for the restoration of the kingdom of God. And what Paul is saying is, Jesus is the Messiah. And God's kingdom is larger than Israel. And if Paul were at here today, what he would say is, Hey, God's kingdom is bigger than Nigeria. God's kingdom is bigger than America. God's kingdom is bigger than what you think it is. And Jesus is not a Republican. Jesus is not a Democrat. God's kingdom is not blue, red, green, or independent. It is much bigger. It is not an elephant or donkey. It's a lion. Paul is saying to them, you're thinking too small. What you, have, what you crave has come. It's Jesus Christ. Look no further. Because what they were obsessed with, is Jesus taking over. But Paul was trying to tell him, hey, guys, listen to me. Jesus is coming to take over. But this is what happened when he gave the message. Look at it. And some were convinced by what he said, but others disbelieved. This happens whenever you preach the gospel. There are people who are going to receive it, and there are people who are going to reject the gospel. You win some, you lose some. Sadly, because that's the condition of the human heart. But we are not responsible for how people respond. Our job is to tell our story and how God has transformed our story. And so Paul, imagine this room, that's sitting there and Paul is talking to them. And in verse 26 and 27, Paul quotes a passage from Isaiah. Jesus quoted the same passage to the Pharisees. And what what did the passage say? You hear, but you don't understand. You see, but you never perceive. Let me say it again. You hear, but you don't understand. You see, but you don't perceive. This is some heavy words. Jesus quoted the same passage to the Pharisees. Strong words. Just so you know, we as pastors, we're entrusted with the responsibility of teaching the Word of God. And this strikes fear in us. I never want this to be true of us. That we hear the Word of God, but we don't allow it to change our lives. You see, the Bible was not written for our information. The Bible was written for our transformation. The Bible was not written for us to study. The Bible was written to change our lives. The psalmist says it. Thy word I have downloaded in my heart that I will not sin against you. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet. It gives me direction. It gives me instruction. So the Bible was written to change our lives. It is so dangerous. To have a hard heart towards truth. That's why I love the sign we have in our green room. 
It's important that we teach and that we prepare. But we have to pray as pastors constantly, as Bible teachers, every time we get on a stage. Because we have to remember that preaching is only as effective as the preacher. Is, 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 preaching is effective as long as the preacher expects something to happen. Not because of the sermon or the preacher, but it's because of the Spirit of God. Whoever stands up here during the week, reading commentaries, checking historical records, figuring out a train of thought that can be followed by the whole group, thinking about the Bible from different angles, creating tensions to solve, has to remember that at the end of the day, it's the power of the Holy Spirit that is at work. It's God who does the work. Whatever we do up here, we have to be faithful to it. We have to do the work. We have to prepare. But you know what? At the end of the day, it's the Holy Spirit that's working. So that's why we pray for you. That you allow the Holy Spirit to move as we open the pages of this priceless book. So this is the question I have in my mind. As Paul quotes this heavy scripture, as Paul is attacked constantly, <coughs> as he's attacked verbally, physically, beaten and shipwrecks, as he gets gossips, false accusations, slander, being dragged, physically hurt, why doesn't he give up? Why? What is up with this guy? What? kind of life does this guy have? Why does he give up? You know why he doesn't give up? Because he believes that he's doing exactly what God has called him to do. Some of you know this. You can think back at a time at work where you refuse to fudge a number. You refuse to mislead upper management. And then conflict happened. But you weren't rattled. Because you had a peace from God. Because at the end, you were vindicated. Or you have a leadership role. Whether it's a family, or at work, or a ministry. And you did something that was unpopular, but it was the right thing. Because what is right is not always popular. And what is popular is not always right. But you did the right thing. And you felt uncomfortable. But God gave you the peace of God. And it's peaceful when God's work is moving forward. Look at verse 30 and 31. He lived there two whole years as we finish this passage. I love these words that appear here. As he lived there two whole years at his own expense and welcomed all who came to him, proclaiming the kingdom of God and teaching about the Lord Jesus Christ with all boldness and without hindrance. What a positive and wonderful finish. That he taught the word of God with boldness. Some of you might remember in chapter 4. The believers were beaten. They were threatened for preaching. Do you remember that? And what did they do? After they didn't ask God for protection, they got together and prayed. They didn't pray for safety. They didn't pray to be left alone. They huddled up and pray. And what he said is, God, give us boldness. We are going to do the work. We're going to do your work. That's a given. We are, go we are ready to take the hits and, lo and lose some stuff if it's your will. I love this chapter because it's about proclaiming the kingdom of God and teaching the Lord about the Lord Jesus Christ with all boldness and without hindrance. In chapter 4, the church prays for it. And it's given to them for years and years. And later in chapter 28, as we wrap this book up, the boldness of those who have gone before us is an example to us. The church isn't perfect. Yes, it, history isn't squeaky clean. But the movement has survived because of the boldness of those 
who have gone before us. It started with Jesus. It was his idea. And then Peter and then John got it rolling. Then Paul came along and ran with it. And the keys were handed to Timothy. Then Clement, then Ignatius, then Polycarp, then Anthonius, then Nicholas, and on and on. Generation after generation. And today we gather in the name of Jesus, grateful for the boldness of men and women who carried the baton told the line, many of whom sacrificed money, houses, comfort, relationships. Why? Because they knew it was worth it. For them, it was all about eternity. And they were faithful to God's calling to keep this moving forward in boldness. The baton now is ours. And what we we'll do with it determines what we hand to the next generation. We set the next generation up to win. We clear a path for them and hand them not just momentum, but something that is thriving and healthy. Doing that is going to take boldness. The church did not sit in a holding pattern to run out the clock. And we are not going to do that. We need courage. We need boldness. So now that I've talked about boldness, what kind of three boldness? What, what are three ways that we can be bold? Number one, we can be bold in your prayers. You can be bold in your prayers. I love to pray normal prayers. How many of you pray for your family regularly, right? I have a beautiful family. This is my beautiful uh, wife from Nigeria. This is how I, I like to pray for her every morning. I like to, I wear, I wear three bracelets, one for, for symbolizing my, myself, my wife, and my son. I pray for them regularly. I pray for our little baby boy, AJ. Yeah, you know, I just, I just love to show that picture. <laughs> mommy loves to dress him up. I don't know. Is this the thing that mommies always dress him up? She has a picture for almost every week of his life. Is that, is that a thing? She even has a picture for almost every month. Like month number one, week one. Month number two, day two. And, and it's just amazing. And, and I like to pray for my baby AJ. And I'm going to be on the plane on Wednesday to go see him. And I'm excited about that. But you know what? Those prayers are wonderful, praying. But you know what? I need to learn to pray boldly. Pray for people who have hurt me. Did you hear what I said? Huh? Pray for people who have hurt me. Pray that they will find Jesus. Pray that Jesus will find them. Now, when he finds them, I want him to do something great. Okay, 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 okay. <laughs> but pray that God speaks to them on the inside. Pray that God gives me the boldness to invite them to church. Pray that Jesus reveals himself to them. I was sitting next on the plane from Baltimore this morning, sitting next to a young lady. She went to Howard University, and we got talking about culture. And I said, I'm a Christian. She, she said, you're a conservative? I said, hey, I'm a Christian. There's a difference. And I had to explain to her the difference between a conservative and a Christian. I'm a Christian first. But I had to explain to her. It took boldness in the plane to say, I'm a Christian. I don't introduce myself as a pastor. I'm a Christian first. For those of you who are parents, pray bold prayers for the younger generation. This summer, every week, some of you were told me, Pastor James, I'm praying for you. And you know what? We felt your prayers. You know why? This summer, every week, I saw over 15 to 20 teenagers walk Forward in front of your friends to give your life to Jesus. Can we celebrate that? <laughs> Woo! It was awesome. I mean, no music. No. Open your eyes. Your friends are out here. High schoolers, over 150 high schoolers. And I said, hey, if you want to give your life to Jesus, stand up in front of your friends and come up right here. And I watched them. 15 of them get up from their chair. Bold as an African lion. 
walked up and they said, yes. And I knew somebody was praying. You know what I'm praying for? We have a, a thousand kids at that camp. I would love to see 5,000 kids at that camp, right? That's a bold prayer. Pray bigger. Be bold in your witness. People say never talk about politics, which is wise. You'd be hard-pressed. Pastor Scott is a good example to me. You'd be hard-pressed to find Pastor Scott or Junior posting anything about politics. Publicly, online, you never hear them. But then, talking about God publicly? Yeah. Imagine somebody telling me, don't post a picture about your wife. Seriously, bro? That's my wife. That's my world. I can post pictures about God. Yeah, we should be able to post about God and talk about God. And talk with friends. Be like Andrew and Peter. All they did is simply invite their friends to God. Do you know when this is hard for me? To be bold in my witness is when I go to meeting with some business clients. And we're sitting down and I'm the only Christian. And food comes. Do you know it's really hard to say, um, gentlemen, can we pray for the food? How many of you have experienced that stress a little bit? Or when you just want to pray. And you know, you can either shy away, pray quietly for your food. But then when you look at all of them and say, hey, uh, before I eat, I have a practice. And I pray for my food. And you know what? 99% of the time when I've said that, they'll say, yeah, that's fine, James. Go ahead. Pray. We don't know what you're doing, but go ahead. Do it. If you do it, if you don't be a witness, what happens is we as Christians focus on ourselves. And we're just a bunch of people doing church. And we lose sight of the mission. We need to be bold about our faith. We need to invest in relationships. So how do you do that? Go to the same gas station. Go to the same coffee place. Go where you can develop a relationship with someone long term and then start talking to them about God. Next time somebody asks you, how was your weekend? Don't tell them it was good. Tell them, hey, I got to be bold. I had this Nigerian guy in church on Sunday. <laughs> now you have some work to do. Witness, invite boldly. And thirdly, be bold in your giving. This is a tough one to talk about in church, I must admit. But Jesus wasn't. He talked about money in his sermons more than any topic. Paul wasn't. He knew what it was like to be bold in his own personal giving, and he saw the blessing. And I can't, I can't help but think that our church will be propelled into the future if we truly practice what Jesus taught about this church subject and gave our first and best to God for kingdom expansion. If we take boldness in our giving to do what God has called us to do, we know God doesn't need our resources, but the work of God does. He's called us, his people, to resource his work. Hey, someone has to pay to cut the grass at camp. Someone has to feed those kids. Someone has to give scholarships, which some people have done. It takes a lot to run that. In all seriousness, if we all listen to Jesus and God's serious about giving, to give our first and best to his kingdom work, it will be as powerful as possible. See, when my father died about a year ago, I ran into something in the family room. This was it. In the 1960s, when my father first decided he was going to go as a missionary in Africa, this was what his business card looked like. In the old church, they used to call it prayer cards. And the old saints would take, it would go to different churches and give them these cards. And they would take these cards and they would put them on their fridge and they would pray for him as they supported him and they gave him resources. When my father died, I, I made a request to my mother because my father always loved to hear me preach. And when I go back to Africa, 
my father did not leave us houses and cars. But you know what he left us? A legacy of faith. You know what he had? There was a Christian school with over 500 children. There was a Bible institute with over 10 students every year graduated. And when I preached this funeral, I said, is there anybody here who was called to the ministry under the ministry of my father? And guess what? 30 men stood up with their families. I remember my father taking us to a town that was 70% Muslim, Mina, Niger State. And every morning we would wake up and we would hear, Allah, 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 Allah. And he would carry his Bible. And he would go door to door, boldly proclaiming that faith. He didn't leave me houses. He didn't leave me cars. But what he did was leave me a legacy. We have been given this priceless movement that has blood, sweat, and tears invested in it for 2,000 years. And we only get a moment to mark, to make our mark until we pass it on. We cannot afford to hold back. I cannot afford to be shy. We cannot be distracted or wear out. This isn't the time to run out the clock and do the bare minimum. Whatever it is, look those who have gone before us. We must be bold. We have a unique opportunity in front of us. So why is God calling you to be bold? Why is God calling you to be bold? Are you boldly praying? Are you boldly inviting? What's a name? What's a face? Are you boldly giving? Are you seeking first the kingdom of God? Where is God calling you to be bold? Father, thank you for Jesus who lived a life of boldness. Thank you for Paul. Thank you for Timothy. Thank you for Peter, James, and John. And they've handed the baton down to us us to be bold. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, what an awesome way to end just our message and our time in Acts. Let's all stand to our feet together. We got a long way to go to reach the goal that God's put before us. But let's just sing that last song, looking ahead to what God's done and celebrating all that he's done together. And now, on a throne of majesty, the Father's will complete. He reigns in victory. Sing hallelujah to the King. He is worthy to receive all the worship we can bring. Let's sing that again. Sing hallelujah. All the worship we can bring What he 
Isn't it so good to have James here and to have him bring the message? Man, we miss James. We love James. I know he's going back to Africa, but we are going to miss him a lot. But also that message that he gave, oh man, having boldness, if we really believe the gospel, if we really believe this God who's transformed our lives, how do we not go out and tell everyone? Because if your lives have been changed, we have to go tell people about this God who loves them so much. I do want to say if you are a first-time guest, thank you so much for joining us. On your way out, make sure you stop by the welcome desk. We would love to give you a first-time guest gift. I would also love to invite our prayer counselors up right now. These men and women, they would love to pray for you about anything. Maybe it's a question about faith. Maybe it's a question about the gospel. They're a great place to start. And then before you get out of here, would you turn to the person next to you and say hello? I hope you guys have a great day and God bless.